Uh, welcome everybody, this is Ben Scallon with Gripped Media and today we're going to be talking to Dr. James Lindsay about the Black Lives Matter movement and the defacement of statues and all those kinds of topical issues. So very good to speak to you today, James. Very good to be here. Uh, so first of all, I just have to forewarn you that uh, nothing you say in this interview will actually matter considering the pigment of your skin. Our, our viewers at home can see that you're a white male and so uh, this might be a little bit pointless, this whole conversation. Right, that's the name of the game today is that uh, what knowledge and insight you have is dependent upon your lived experience with a particular skin color. Um, there's nothing at all racist in this ideology whatsoever with a, with a statement like that, nothing at all, uh, except everything. And so if that's the case, that's fine. I will still do my best. <laughs> so for the benefit of our viewers at home who might not have heard of you, if you could just give us a little bit of a background as to who you are, how you got interested in these ideas, uh, that'd be fantastic. All right. There's no easy way to do this. So this will take a second. Um, my background originally would be that my, my academic background is that I have a PhD in mathematics uh, that I earned in 2010 and I left academia just after that. And so I did not stay in the university system. I started to study philosophy and psychology kind of independently uh, at that point. I got very interested in the psychology and philosophy of, uh, well, I the philosophy, I should say, of science, the philosophy and psychology of religion. Um, in particular, I started to look at uh, conversion mechanisms, the psychological underpinning of conversion, uh, cult indoctrination, and authoritarianism became very interesting topics for me in that regard. And then um, in the 2015-14 range, I started to notice that the I, I was involved in what was known as the atheism movement or the new atheism movement at the time, which is important because it's nominally non-religious. And I, I was I was noticing that the, there was very religious-like behavior occurring within the movement, and it was all centered around ideas of sexism and racism that were defined in a vague and kind of uh, mystical, systemic sense. And so I was watching what looked like witch hunts of various people. Uh, there were, in my opinion, very falsely accused of racism and sexism and Islamophobia and so on. And then uh, this started to turn into, I mean, it turned into destroying the movement from within, toppling all of its leaders, turning it into this kind of uh, grubby fest of, of complainers from the bottom that kind of took it over. So I got very interested in how this happened and kind of changed my direction of research into looking into that literature, which at the time I believed was sociology. Um, Turns out that it was not specifically sociology. It's mostly, it is in sociology, but it has mostly come out of a branch of the humanities that has decided to pretend that it's scientific and um, uses very obscure jargon. It's deeply rooted in postmodern and uh, neo Marxist theory. And so I started to study that. 2017 rolls around and myself with two colleagues, Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose, decided to expose the problem within academia that this scholarship was no longer being criticized. There, are, For example, right now we have this idea called critical race theory that has become very famous because of its association with the Black Lives Matter movement and all of these things happening. And the last real academic criticism of critical race theory is from the late 1990s. And so nobody was criticizing this stuff and it's just been able to kind of run amok. And so we wanted to expose that and we thought the, a good way to do that would be to write a series of fake academic papers poking at gender studies and critical race theory and queer theory and post-colonial studies and so on. So, so we wrote, we spent a year writing 20 fake academic papers. Seven of them were accepted for, for publication and four of them were actually published. One won an award for excellence. They were all made up. We started with our conclusions, which were intentionally ridiculous or horrifying and worked backwards to get to them through their literature. And um, I, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I remember hearing about one of them. I believe you took uh, some, some of the wording from Mein Kampf and replaced all the references to uh, Jewish people with white men and this kind of thing and that, that they had no problem with that. In particular, the, the paper was that we took the 12th chapter of Mein Kampf. The 12th chapter is actually Hitler's kind of manifesto of what his movement, which became the Nazi party, should look like. 
and we replaced the idea of our movement with intersectional feminism and then just kind of filled in some theory and massaged the language and made sure it wouldn't get caught by plagiarism uh, algorithms and then submitted that to a feminist social work journal that accepted it. Uh, so yes, uh, that was part of what we did. That, that became known as the Grievance Studies Affair. Um, following the Grievance Studies Affair, actually it sort of started before, Helen and I, of the my colleagues that did this, had intended to write a book explaining some of the evolution of the philosophy behind these ideas. So we dove full bore into the research for that and have written that book. It comes out ambiguously this summer. It was supposed to be in May, but the pandemic slowed everything down. So July or August, no later than August 25th, that book's called Cynical Theories. And uh, that explains how postmodern philosophy got involved with uh, this very radical activism and has kind of defined the thing that we're looking at today. And from there, since that book was finished, I continued the research and have created a platform called New Discourses that tries to produce uh, informative and educational resources so people can understand this movement in its own terms. I don't, I mean, I, I write articles that are critical of it, but I also am producing an encyclopedia of its terminology that I'm trying to make as fair and balanced and representative of their views as I can while still keeping a foot outside of that worldview. So that's who I am and how I got to where I am now. Long bio, it's hard to describe who I am and what I do really. <laughs> Well, uh, I noticed in your Twitter bio, or uh, I think it's actually in your Twitter name, uh, one of the things that you have is the phrase uh, anti-revolutionary. And I'm just wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit about that. What, what did you mean by that specifically? When all of these riots and things started, I just decided to put my foot down and say, this is a, this is a, this is a revolution. This is a social and cultural revolution. And if it can, it will be a political revolution. And I'm a liberal. I don't want revolutions. I firmly believe that the proper liberal re revolutions of the late 18th century were the were the last necessary revolution because we, it, not in terms of maybe technology, but at that time we established not perfect systems, but systems that can properly self-correct and systems that decentralize power and systems that are open to um, and defer to objective standards or the most objective standards possible uh, that that allow them to resolve conflict successfully. So I don't think that liberalism is some magic bullet. I do think, however, that it is a uh, conflict resolution mechanism that may not be may not have equal. So um, I'm not in fan. Uh, liberalism doesn't proceed upon revolutions. It proceeds upon um, kind of orderly procedural change so that we don't make the mistakes that come with revolutions, which typically lend, very rarely does a revolution go well. There are examples in history, but usually they become the the, the ground for, for either disruption that leads to, to cartels taking over, or they become the, the cause that installs a despot. One of the things that people forget, uh, we always use the phrase reign of terror, usually in reference to uh, a despotic dictator oppressing a people or this kind of thing. But the historical reign of terror during the French Revolution was the tyranny of the mob. It was, you know, the anarchy that ensued after the entire system was flipped on its head. And, you know, you have guillotinings in the streets and mass bloodshed and mass slaughter. So without any kind of, uh, when, when you've subverted all of society's rules and, and all of the uh, limiting factors, like the police, they want to abolish the police now, you know, people setting up their own autonomous zones and their own mini states within, within the nation, uh, then who's to stop the most radical elements, people even more extreme than the people involved from going even further than anybody anticipated or wanted, you know? That's exactly right. What people tend not to understand in these situations, they get very you know, zealous and they get worked up. And what, what's happening in kind of the simplest description is that people are seeing that the system is imperfect. The policing system is imperfect. The prison system is imperfect. The, the, the criminal justice system is imperfect. Sometimes people get away with crime. Sometimes it's too hard to prove something. 
Sometimes there are miscarriages of justice. Sometimes there are bad cops and there are systems that allow bad cops. There are imperfections in the system. The rule of law, the law itself is rarely perfect. In fact, it should never be perfect. It should always be kind of in a, in a state of being perfected. And because the system, that has to be the case because the situation changes. You invent the internet, the whole world's different. You have to have different laws. We had to invent laws to prevent revenge pornography specifically, which wasn't possible before revenge pornography was technologically a feasible thing to make. So the system, the situation changes, so the law can't be perfect. And so the reaction is we're going to get rid of the law. But the point, again, to appeal to these liberal ideas like rule of law, the point of a system like rule of law is to create a conflict resolution system that re prevents the, the ar arising of might makes right. And so when you create a vacuum around that, might will make right. Whoever has either the strongest ability to uh, call people maybe, you know, discrediting names like racist or sexist or whoever has the, the most muscle or the biggest guns or whatever will fill the space and eventually it will come to physical to physical control because it always has to. Somebody will get called a racist and decide that that's not good enough because they want power in one of these lawless zones and they'll shoot somebody. And at that point it becomes, I don't know if you've seen the film about, about Rio de Janeiro called City of God where the, it demonstrates how the cartels have completely taken over and run the city. Uh, it's a horrifying film. That's, the, that's where this goes in these kind of autonomous zones if they're allowed to run long enough because eventually somebody figures out that physical intimidation uh, works. That's in fact what the point of rule of law enforced by police is, is that we, we outsource the, the, uh, the, the authority to use physical violence to an entity that's supposed to be accountable to the public uh, in general. Uh, through you know the various legal and and judicial mechanisms, and so when we decide to take that into our own hands, it's whoever can exert the most power is going to win, and then we're we're in a really bad place. It's really hard to fix. That South American states have been fighting to repair for decades now. Uh, I, I I suppose uh, the natural question then is when we see all of these. Uh, you know, autonomous zones being set up. A lot of people, they have an instinct to laugh at it. They say it's silly, it's ridiculous, you know, memes, haha, you know, what, what a crazy thing. But do you think people are, are taking the situation happening in America at the moment, do you think they're taking it seriously enough? I mean, we look at the, um, the destruction of sim symbols, statues and things like that. And a lot of people say, well, you know, it's not good, but it's, they're physical objects. What does it matter? Uh, what would you say to somebody who thought that this is sort of a minor uh, tantrum that will blow over in, in a week or so? I don't think this tantrum's blowing over, first of all, and I don't think people are taking it seriously enough. However, it is hard not to laugh at some of this stuff. I mean, it's pet patently ridiculous, the things that they're saying, and it's patently unstable. So it can't actually manage anything, and whatever it tries to manage will just fall apart and turn into a mess and a cesspool of infighting. So there's this sense that it's all absurd, and it's, of course, expressing itself in the most absurd ways. I saw in the Los Angeles Times yesterday a long, angry article saying that the roads are racist. And so, I mean, it's just, at some level, it's just absurd. But when you start getting into the point where there is actual iconoclasm, where you have the defacing of statues, tearing down of statues, uh, and then, and say, burning an American flag draped over George Washington's now pulled down statue or dragging a statue down the street and stringing it up on a noose hanging from a tree. This is, human beings are symbolic creatures. And this iconoclasm of this sort is a step toward physical violence. And it is a step toward, uh, you know, the genuine kinds of problems that we associate with things like the reign of terror. They are the, be this is a beginning step in almost every single uh, example in history where things have gotten truly out of hand and turned genuinely violent. Iconoclasm is is something that, uh, I should say mob iconoclasm is something that should really be taken um, very seriously. It is not a, it's not a joke. It's not funny. Even if, for example, you have, I mean, when you see the statues that are being torn down, some of them don't even make sense. In Madison, Wisconsin, they're pulling down statues that are actually testaments to the problem of women's violence. They're pulling down statues uh, that were, were erected in terms of, of slavery 
as abolition uh, of their statues of abolitionists and they were erected the way that they were specifically you know using the imagery that the the slavery imagery that they do to convey the story with the permission of the families of the slaves that were involved even the slaves themselves that were involved and so it would the, the point of them was to tell a story so there's almost this mindlessness behind it and when you start to have a mindless bent toward destruction and you start to do it symbolically to human effigies, it's only a matter of time before that gets worse. You actually do have to start paying really close attention to anybody who wants to erase all of history and all of the past and start again at some kind of year zero where all of the, the sins of, of, of the past, all of the four olds have been have been removed from society. Never, never have those movements worked out well. So. Yeah, it's absurd, but this stuff is actually quite serious, and it is not. Um, I d I don't think this one's blowing over. Well, uh, what do you think then? Because you said that you finished your uh, involvement with academia formally in around around 2010, if I'm not mistaken, and then around 2015, 2016, th this kind of time period is when all of this stuff started to really take off. And of course, anybody who is paying attention to politics will know that that sort of coincides with the 2016 election. And it's almost like since Donald Trump, whether people love him or hate him, everything has been brought to a head. It's almost been like a, an accelerant in chemistry that really uh, polarizes and divides everything. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad way. You know, sometimes it's good to clarify things and crystallize and see where where things stand but what, what would be your thoughts on on not not necessarily on his presidency or the merits of him as a person but more on the effect that donald trump has had on u.s culture and on this culture war that's going on so i mean this is actually slightly complicated but i will point out that trump is extremely important and extremely relevant in all the ways that you mentioned let me give a little more background context to that this, of course, has been simmering in the universities for uh, decades. Um, I mean, you could even pin, you, we can look to history for a little bit of a guide. The last time this kind of violence broke out in the United States would have been in 1967 and 1968, which would have been just after Herbert Marcuse's new left followed his advice from his one of his most famous works, which is the essay Repressive Tolerance, that says that revolutionary violence is justified, whereas uh, reactionary violence is not. And so he was at Columbia University at the time. So this this has been in the university for decades and it's been growing and festering in the university for decades, but it has rapidly mainstreamed, very rapidly mainstreamed since about 2010, really. In 2011, for example, you had uh, the Dear Colleague letter that came out in the United States that empowered Title IX legislation uh, and we started to have this kind of rape culture hysteria that arose as a result. You started to have boys hectored out of college on false accusations of sexual misconduct, most of which, almost all of which, in fact, are now being overturned. Well, not overturned, but they're being they're 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 being settled for massive damages in civil court uh, because it's not just. And then that kind of accelerated things into the popular culture sphere. Well, when you start agitating, I know that you guys aren't going to be close up with civil rights. Act legislation in the United States, but these Title IX, that's part of that. It, it, there are several titles. Title VII has to do more with race issues. And so where Title IX got agitated, Title VII is getting agitated as well. And so we see this kind of thing happening there. Meanwhile, lots of other things were happening, but I'll kind of skip forward a bit. From 2011, Dear Colleague, that mainstreamed at some. 2014, you have the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and the origin of the original Black Lives Matter movement. And that exploded. And in fact, much of the voice of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, spoke toward what's now recognized. I mean, it was known since the 80s as, as critical race theory. The original movement used some of that language, some of that appeal, some of that uh, emotion and that, that, that mindset. But then it very rapidly got picked up by activist groups who wanted to either support it or wanted to help it or wanted to co-opt it, if that may be the case, who very explicitly made it about critical race theory. So by 2016 and 17, Black Lives Matter was mainstreaming critical race theory into the public. This, of course, has been part of our education system now for decades because of what's called the critical turn in education, which started in 1980 and has been making this kind of educational program standard in the schools, especially since 2012 and 13. So now you have a very ready population that's going to explode and then all of a sudden Trump runs it 
for president. And Trump, again, like him or hate him, policies, whatever you want to say, I'm not personally a fan, but that's irrelevant. Um, the the orbit around him in the media was racist, sexist, misogynist, all of these horrible things. And to whatever degree they're true, whatever. The point is that it massively inflamed the idea. So critical race theory is kind of mainstreamed. One of the tenets, one of the core tenets of critical race theory is that everybody and everything is actually racist and they, we just hide it. And so they believed that Donald Trump was the unmasking, the election of Donald Trump was the unmasking of a racist society. And they went nuts. What gets called Trump derangement syndrome is actually largely that. There are actually real reasons to be very concerned about some of the ways that Donald Trump behaves and governs. There are legitimate policy differences, but there are also legitimate concerns with, you know, is he kind of trolling his way through the president, is presidency? Is he misusing his office? Uh, is he deconstructing the office that he's in in real time? You know, what's going on? And there, there are a lot of very upsetting aspects to this. But at the same time, there's another aspect of this absolute paralyzing derangement that believes that only a fundamentally corrupt society could possibly have elected somebody like that. And only a fundamentally corrupt society that's described exactly in the way that this critical education, uh, this critical race theory that's been mainstreaming and being pumped into our, our kids through our education systems perfectly seems to explain. So it absolutely went bonkers then. And then what do you have once he's president? Not only do you have a series of attempts to uh, get him in, in various sorts of trouble, to impeach him, to get him tied to the Russian thing, through the Mueller probe, and all of these different things that happened, none of them worked. So now you feel like there's this inability for the system to produce what seems to be necessary justice whether that's perception or reality now is so, so very difficult to tell, but it seems like there are some realities behind the perception at least. And people are noticeably mad about that and very upset. And, and, and they, again, feel like the whole system is corrupt. And so this narrative that they've been fed sideways from the other, other aspects of, of the project have convinced them that he is the absolute proof that we live in a fundamentally corrupt society that needs to be overthrown and, and, and remade from the ground up. Bad idea, but that's that's the belief that's motivating this. So when you look at you know the forthcoming election in 2020, the question has to be, I, I mean, I honestly don't know. Is, I, is it better to vote for Joe Biden, who's if, if he ends up being the nominee for the Democrats, who uh, is obviously going to be able, be in a position to be heavily swayed by this ideology that's justifying burning down cities, which is not okay, defunding police, et cetera, not okay. Uh, or do we go with Donald Trump, who is literally the irritant and the single best piece of, of evidence for a bogus theory that's come along in in quite a long time? And so we're caught in some, some really, you know, the, the, the pinchers of a really nasty vice with with the situation that we're in right now. Um, so I have to acknowledge that I often tell my friends, it's like the United States right now seems to be having a, an allergic reaction that's to the degree of anaphylactic shock. And voting for Trump is like trying to cure it by giving people more of the allergen. And at the same time, you can't kind of capitulate to people who are literally acting like terrorists. So you can't really empower the, the Democrats either. And so I don't know what the solution to that problem is. It's, it's a very bad situation to be in. I don't see things getting better. And that should actually be yet another reason people think this isn't blowing over this time. This isn't a blip in history. This is a current in history. And we need to decide which way we want to channel that rushing water and hopefully it's toward you know uh, rule of law it's scientific reasoning you know the, all of the things they have made uh so much success not for the united states in particular not for the west in particular but for the world everything has been risen up tremendously by uh the developments of of liberal civics and and knowledge production and so hopefully we can channel it in that direction and away from this very revolutionary madness well, uh, I won't take up too much of your time, and I really appreciate everything that you've said so far, but as, as a final note to end on, what do you think of the school of thought that says that the people who are pushing these ideas in, through academia, you know, the long march through the institutions and all the rest of it, the reason that they've done it so successfully up until this point is because it's been so 
slow and just bit by bit and creeping and that it's the frog in the boiling water and the people almost haven't had a chance to notice it or react to it enough and that as terrible obviously as everything that's happening right now is and over the last couple of years we've seen it accelerate to a great degree that it's almost like a, a wake-up call that the people who are hell-bent on pushing this agenda on America and the Western world in general, that they've kind of overplayed their hands and that this might be the moment, the turning point when things start to uh, revert back to some degree of normality. I think that's actually potentially correct. I mean, we don't know. This is a very non-linear situation, as my mathematics background would lead me to say. So we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I would say that, you know, the long march of the institutions has been very successful. Part of that has been because it's been slow. A lot of it has been because of problems in academic culture. Uh, academics are very reluctant to criticize experts outside of their own field. And so this stuff has had no critics because it doesn't allow critics within its own field. And um, it's therefore been able to run amok and start to institutionalize itself with diversity, equity and inclusion offices and deans and so on. Uh, so it has been very successful. My belief on the to the specific question, however, is that yes, the water has been heating up. People are starting have been starting to get uncomfortable, but nobody's really very few people, I should say, have been really sounding the alarm. I know I have been for a couple of years at least, um, maybe five, and then now the water wasn't boiling, the frog wasn't dead, and they have jacked the heat up to almost full. Uh, maybe that's because the pandemic made everybody a little too online and a little too nuts. Maybe that's because the George Floyd murder was a spark that was in, that, that could set off the tinder and it came much sooner than than you know the movement got away from its its orchestrators, if you will. But I do think they have overplayed their hand, and I do think there are enough people who are able to look at this and start seeing that something is badly wrong with this. It didn't have power. It only has a large degree of cultural hegemony, and that's kind of a very soft form of power. Of course, being canceled or ostracized by your friends and family is not soft. It's horrible, but it's not the kind of power that has full backing by by law, the full power of the courts behind it, the full power of, say, even, you know, police or military behind it. And so it's a very soft kind of power, relatively speaking. And I think they have tried to clamp the jaws down too soon. And so the question that is open now is, will enough people recognize it and start to learn strategies, A, to understand it, and B, to push back upon it, which mostly involves, by the way, just saying no. Uh, th these people are acting like toddlers, and if you actually treat them like toddlers who are throwing a fit, that's actually mostly the strategy to, to combat them. And then to see, say, yeah, you know what, I'm willing to listen more, I'm willing to listen better. You can say that the riot is the voice of the unheard, and I'm fine with listening better. Maybe we do need to listen better, but we're not gonna listen like this. We're not gonna tear down statues to get rid of them. If you wanna get rid of them, we're gonna petition. So every statue you tore down is gonna go back up, and then we'll, we'll have a referendum, and we'll see which ones stay, and which ones change, and which ones come down, and which ones are retooled into an educational space. And we're going to do this by the book. And so there's an opportunity for people to recognize these problems and to start saying, you know what, maybe there are problems, but we're going to do them a different way. We're not going to give in to these, these bullies. Um, and so I think that there is a window now. Again, when you start talking about, you know, we have our presidential election in a few months, and then by January, you know, if Trump loses the election, Trump's out of office, we could have total regime, regime change, if you will. Uh, so the window might be closing quickly. The, the case in California where they're trying to make it out, take it out of their constitution, their state constitution, that discrimination is bad. If that comes out of the constitution, the, they start to get the legal aspect on their side rather, and, and then the soft power becomes hard power. So there is a window and that window is closing. Uh, people like myself, I see myself as trying to put a block between the, the, the bottom of the window and where it's falling so that we can hold it open a little bit longer so people can get get the idea and, and, and try to try to try to reestablish, you know, what works in society while taking the lessons from from this kind of temper tantrum that we need to minimize future temper tantrums. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much, James. It was great to talk to you. Absolutely. Take care.